I think that was a pretty exciting start. <laughs> <laughs> So I, let me, uh, before I ask the first question, let me just ask Kirk, do you want to sort of uh, say anything before I, we get the discussion going on? Do you have any reactions? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I suspected that, but I... <laughs> well, listen, the, the question is, are we going to have, you know, there's many things that Danny said that, I, that it's impossible to disagree with, um, but it's that taking that next step or, um, you know, let's talk about what the two, two agreements are and are not. Mm -hmm. One Belt, One Road right now has very little meat on the bones, mm -hmm. right? And um, so what is going to happen as uh, China now, as the, the Indian foreign minister said two years ago when she was here, goes through her words, Pakistani occupied Kashmir. You know, how is that going to go? You know, this concept that, that everything is just smoothly going to go through the estimated 61 countries. Uh, with no issues, I, I think it, to sort of put them in the same conversation, one is at, at close to ratification and one is really a lot of, a lot of conceptual. Um, so I think that what is and isn't uh, is in a very different place. And I'll even bring up uh, AIIB. You know, it's not like there is a ton of deals sitting on World Bank and Asian Development Bank that aren't getting funded right now. The reality is um, there aren't bankable deals in this region, even, even in infrastructure. So if you're looking at doing a, an energy deal in Vietnam, for example, the issue is not financing, it's that tariffs make those deals not bankable. So if you tell me there's another entity out there that's going to try and make those deals bankable, um, we'll compete, and uh, our banks, our commercial banks, Asian Development Bank, um, World Bank, along with AIB, and that's great. But I think that some of these things are much less along than sometimes we get the conversation about. Okay. Um, you know, just going back to a, a, a point that uh, Danny made, you know, when he said that uh, President Obama said that, you know, if, you, if TPP fails, then countries like China will write the rules of the game. I think I'm not correct. That, that's well, that was the quote that Danny yeah. said. I mean, I, 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 my experience with my president is a little bit more articulate than that. So I don't know. I'm, not take, I'm sure you're right. Um, but I find that, that that, again, is a false equivalency. Mm. One is talking about rules. One is talking about what we would say in the States, Wild West. Mm. One is rules and one is no rules. It's not who's going to write the rules. It's mm. do we want rules or not rules. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think... That's where we, we sometimes have dissonance in the conversation. Is it, it, you know, it, it's a little frustrating to hear out here, as, as we often do, about some countries complaining about uh, they now want to seat under rules. And you say, well, what rules do you not want uh, in place? And the answer is none. Not we want it to be more equal. It's that they, don't want, they want it to be a little bit more uh, you know, law of the jungle. And you know, I, I think that. The global economic architecture is not just the United States, and I think that's uh, the default position out here. We have 12 countries. Uh, if you're a Singapore or a Chile or a Peru, uh, you, it can't be big countries can do one thing, little countries can do another. You need a global architecture, which all uh, is interrelated. Mm -hmm. So that's what TPP does. You add TTIP to that. You're talking about um, setting a global standard, and it's a global standard that every country in this region has benefited from for the la better part of the last 70 years, none more so than China. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's a little bit, okay, we've got to the top, let's pull the ladder up and go law of the jungle. And that doesn't mm -hmm. seem like that's very good to every country not named China. Yeah, mm -hmm. I expect there are lots of questions, but let me just ask one more quick question, Kirk. I actually agree with you that the TPP has got very good 21st century rules and that it will be good for all the participants. If that's the case, why is the political support for it so low in the US now? Well, I don't think there's many people that, that vote on trade that are people who've actually looked at it. They know what their lives and their feeling after the Great Recession of 2008. Mm. Uh, they say their lives not improving to maybe a pre-2008 uh, level. You see, uh, no one from Wall Street going to jail. You see a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's natural to listen to uh, some political leaders, commentators, uh, you know, YouTube stars, and mm -hmm. blame it. But I think it's 
I think it's hard to argue that the vast majority of the change in our employment market has come mostly from uh, innovation and productivity gains. Uh, and then any job loss that's happened because of globalization was by people, well, by countries that we don't have trade agreements with. Mm. So to, to then say it's trade agreements that are the problem, uh, it's a little bit like having a bad day at work and coming home and kicking your dog. It's not mm. your dog's fault. And you know that's kind of where we are in the discussion. Yeah. Okay. So can you can you ask Danny something? Anything? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's just no, right. No, I, I, I was. Uh, you know why? Because <laughs> because because I mean, Danny spoke after you, and he said, "I'm going to disagree with His Excellency." So I was trying to give you a chance to uh, respond. I was trying to level the playing field. <laughs> <laughs> a long way to go. <laughs> uh, so, who would like to ask the first uh, question? Yes. I'm, uh, I suppose I have to introduce myself. Yes. I'm Dr. Chan. I'm a surgeon. I used to be a professor of surgery, and uh, now I'm retired. I'm uh, close to 90 years old, and uh, I have a great interest in what's happening in the world. Uh, and I think, uh, like many of us, many in the audience, we are largely, mainly English educated, and we read mainly English newspaper, newspapers and news weeklies, and so we have no choice but to be uh, influenced greatly by the Western viewpoint. It is very difficult for people like us, or like me, uh, to be objective and uh, think of the world uh, in a more fair and equal way because we are so, I know, you are going to ask me what is the question I'm going to ask. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, if you don't yeah. mind, because I expect, as usual happens, people take a long time in asking right. the first question, yeah. but there will be lots of questions coming up. So sure. if you don't okay. mind, you have to finish the All six. Right. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. The question I will ask uh, to ask uh, uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador, why is he a little bit coy about mentioning uh, TPP, which actually is started by Singapore. Singapore, Brunei, Chile, uh, New, Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. Small countries, small economies. Uh, I think uh, Professor Danny Quack said that it was said so in the uh, Washington Post, but actually uh, the man who said, well, do you want to write the rules, do you want China to write the rules, or do you want us, we, to write the rules, America that is, because the man who said this was President Barack Obama, and I can prove it by playing a DVD of him saying that. Why are you a little bit coy about that? Why not uh, be very uh, forward and uh, call a spade a spade? Well, I, I think you, you misunderstood me, Doctor, because uh, I'm not saying he didn't say it. I just think he probably said it better than Denny. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I have said that myself, because I go back to what I just said. It's not really about mm. one side or the other writing the rules. It's either having rules or no rules. Yes. Okay. Now, the other question I'd like to ask... Very, very quickly, if you don't mind, Dr. Chan. Yeah. Sorry. I see you can see there's a queue developing here. Yeah, oh. yeah. All right. Uh, just a very short question. Uh, now you've uh, taken away my uh, train of thought. So, uh, maybe i let them... Okay, we let I, them go first. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll call you later. Okay, you please. Yeah. Uh, my question is, on behalf of all the pragmatists here, can either of you envisage a path where China and the U.S. gets closer to each other and we can stop all this zero-sum talk? Come on, you got to say something. All right, I'm, I'm having a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me up here. <laughs> You're getting all the best lines. Uh, <laughs> the, I think that there are pragmatists on both sides working very hard to do exactly what you say, overcome the zero-sum nature of the discussion. Uh, 
you know, I, have, I have good friends in the U.S. Treasury who work very hard at trying to make sure that it is the trade deals that are between the United States and China in the strategic and economic dialogue that take primacy over all the hot air that's been emerging from you know, the geopolitical conflict points. I think people are working very hard on both sides, but you do, I think we all do at the same time have to watch out for the saber rattling that every now and then appears in two jet fighters flying 50 feet from each other, you know, a slight gust of wind the wrong way, and then all of a sudden we're looking at something that's very undesirable. I hope that the pragmatic position uh, comes more to the forefront. I think people are sensible, both Americans and Chinese. And uh, they too, you know, the worst thing that happens in the world for economics, for domestic politics, is international conflagration, is war. It's the, it kills not just hum, it kills humans, it kills business, it destroys progress, and the world has come to that kind of a realization, I hope. So, pragmatists, yay. <laughs> well, I, but, you know, Kishore has heard me say this for three years, we're already doing that. Uh, Danny mentioned the strategic and economic dialogue. Three years ago, we had 60 different lines of communication. And what that means is like our fishery nerds are talking to their fishery nerds. Like I mean just like the next year there was 81 different bandwidths and last year there was 118. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a moment in history where at least we were a relevant uh, country in the conversation where we've ever been as close. And there's an old adage in uh, American politics that uh, if, if we agree on 80% and disagree on 20%, we're 80% friends, not 20% enemies. Mm -hmm. And everyone out here really wants to focus on the competition, which is real, you know, we, we, but we, we compete with Germany, we compete with Japan, we compete with Canadians, they're very slippery. Um, <laughs> I was born in Canada, for those of you who don't know that. Um, uh, sor sort of a sleeper cell, really. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the, uh, it, it's sexier to talk about the conflict. And, you know, I go back to AIIB as one of those moments. Um, it's very, it was very frustrating to me where the, uh, the narrative was that um, our government was telling countries not to join AIIB. Well, my job was to talk to Singapore before they joined AIIB. So perhaps you might like to know what someone who is the personal representative of the President of the United States was tasked to and did ask. And in my role, what I said was, all of you countries are going to join this thing. We all know it. But you say you want... Uh, transparency, global standards, all those things. So this is, uh, it's got international standards that if you're going to invest, you're going to invest across these things that you care about, get it on the front end. Don't get in and then do it afterwards. Now I can tell you now, after we had these 17 countries that were founding members, that this, that this organization, AIIB, actually does, at least purports to have, some of these very high standards. Now I don't know if that is because we were pushy on the front end, or it was gonna happen anyways, but I never once, not one time, said to the government of Singapore, don't join AIIB. So it drives me nuts when you read that stuff in the FT, because that was my job to do it, and it didn't happen. So the amount of interaction that we have with China right now is at an all-time high. And the only reason we have the Paris Agreement going into effect today or yesterday was because our two countries led the world. So, I mean, I, we can go through this chapter and verse. That doesn't mean we're not going to compete on things. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to try and inject myself into the discussion, but I just came back yesterday from Beijing after spending six days as a distinguished visiting professor at Schwarzman College, and I met lots of Chinese there. And I would say my assessment is that, uh, to just put it very mildly, the level of suspicion mm -hmm. in China about United States from all my visits has risen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course it may be, uh, how do you say, um, not necessary, it may be wrong, but it's actually quite real. When you oh, go I, I don't disagree with that, but let's, yeah. let's, let's have an honest conversation here. Yeah. So the view of China, let's say, towards Japan. Yeah. People who are over 60 have a better opinion of the Japanese and what went on in the Second World War than people under 30 in China have about Japan. So the rise of nationalism, mm -hmm. and it, whether it be in Philippines, whether it be in Brexit or wherever, is very real. But it is not just an economic tool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yes, uh, is there uh, a reason for 
there to be a trust deficit? Does it serve other interests that might not yeah. be economic, like perhaps staying in power and a, and a cohesion to do other things? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But these are complicated, three-dimensional chess mm -hmm. conversations. Yeah. But just to say there's a trust deficit, sure. Mm. Yeah, but anyway, that, that's what I sense there. So anyway, let's go. I see lots of questions. So why don't we take three, and then we can uh, move on. Take one, please, one, uh, two, three, the first three. Go ahead. Hi, my name's June Park, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the LKY School. Thank you for both of your uh, presentations. I just have a quick question about um, the foreign policy direction of the United States with regard to TPP and OBOR. Uh, as Kurt Campbell states in his latest book, I think that in the previous administrations there has been a significant emphasis on policies regard with regard to the Middle East as compared to the East Asian region. Um, uh, for Ambassador, how do you see the next administration's um, foreign policy design with regard to balancing these two regions as China also tries to get into the Middle East economically uh, by forging ties with Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And for Dr. Kwa, you mentioned the geopolitical zero-sum game, but um, what I see as an irony in this region is economically, yes, there's significant embeddedness with China, but politically, not many countries seem to welcome China as actively engaging. So how would you disentangle this um, political deficit? Thank you. Good question. Next one, the gentleman at the back there. Oh, we've got to you, we gotta remember these things? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just three questions. Three you know, questions. I'm used to being staffed, Kishore. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> You'll do well. Don't worry. <laughs> Next one, gentlemen at the back deck, please. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Wing Hong. Thanks for the, uh, the, the speeches just now. One of the ways that uh, I, I notice that when people try to um, push away the question of whether OBO or TPP is a zero sum competition and says that uh, TPP is a trade agreement, whereas OBO is more like a, it's more like a infrastructure agreement, right? That, but that being said, uh, I observe that China seems to be uh, building. One of the ways that explains why OBO is so attractive towards uh, many countries is that China is actively subsidizing and even outright building the, the infrastructures of said countries and uh, I would say consolidating the supply networks <laughs> towards China itself. What is the US response to that? Thank you. Okay. That's a question for. Kirk, obviously, uh, next question. Um, Again, quickly, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My name, this is uh, Ashumi, that I'm a public servant of Japan. I have a question. So, is uh, Japan in the past uh, the DTP, DTP, fortunately, is uh, two days ago. But then, the, not only Donald Trump, but, the, but also is uh, Clinton is uh, negative to the TPP. So, I'm concerned about the, the uh, if is the uh, next president is uh, denied the TPP, is a uh, Almost the framework is the clubs then to the especially Philippines is a move to the OBOA. So I'm very concerned about uh, about uh, economic crisis again and the uh, same as the uh, Brexit. So uh, I hope to the some uh, is a uh, answer. <laughs> you, so you want you yeah. want some optimism from yeah. Yeah. Cook. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> okay, so Kirk, do you want to go first? And sure. Then, uh, um, I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity for Ms. Park's question because I think that that's the question about uh, the sustainability of American involvement out here is probably the easiest question I can answer. That's the one I get asked all the time. And, you know, we're not engaged in Asia because we like Asia. We do. But we're here because it's in our core national interests. There are 525 million people in the middle class today in Asia. By 2030, which is right around the corner, close to us in the year 2000, that number is going to be 3.2 billion people in the middle class. It will have seven times the consumer impact of the United States. You know, we all see what's going on in Europe. Latin America, I'm from Miami, I've been staring at that for 30 years. It's a challenge. Africa aspires to only be the challenge that is South America. Where are we going to be? And so the rebalance to Asia, I think, was um, something was occurring before President Obama, but because of his knowledge, particularly of South Asia, uh, I think he did a few things to 
strengthening it, uh, speed it up with uh, having our uh, having our mission to ASEAN be fully stood up, the first uh, non-ASEAN country to have an ambassador designated to uh, ASEAN. Uh, there are others that have come since then. TPP is part of it, but it's not all of it. And I guess the frustrating thing to me was when I got here in uh, 2013, the narrative was we were getting our butts kicked by China all over Southeast Asia. The United States is the largest foreign direct investor into ASEAN, more than the next three countries combined. Right? The amount of jobs and people's lives we've changed and put on a path to the middle class and their families over the last 50 to 70 years, there's got to be 50 million people that we have put through our companies. The problem is China comes and does investments and does it from a government level. So they show up with a big check, they have a press conference, that's great. But people don't consider Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Harley-Davidson, uh, Chevron uh, as us, enough. And we've done a lousy job of taking credit for that, I might add. Uh, but that's the fact, that's how we engage. So, you know, regardless of our, our presidential election, you know, we're out here through our people, and we've been out here for the better part of 240 years. We're not going anywhere because we can't afford to be. Because this region is where we should be curing cancer, going to Mars, solving climate change, developing apps, fashion, all of those things. Um, and I don't think people here appreciate why or how it's in our core national interest. There's no, this is the game in town. Now you mentioned the Middle East, um, and I'll be very quick, Danny, on this, but right. you know, we become energy self-sufficient by the year 2020, if, it not, if not earlier. So the Middle East, it does change the leverage that maybe they have over us and the calculations uh, about our involvement there. Listen, we, it's not just the Middle East. And I, I hope this doesn't come across as arrogant, but there's only one country in the world that if there's a natural disaster or a conflict or something happens that you call. You're not calling Russia, you're not calling China, you're not calling Mexico, you're calling us. And because of that, we are engaged in the world. And sometimes we're gonna bump our toe and maybe not do the right thing or say the right thing, but um, we adhere to global norms that we didn't develop, but we adhere to. Um, so we'll be engaged in the Middle East. Now, if someone else goes into a region, is it from a very one-dimensional point of view of what's required? You know, we're, we're kind of a pain to have at dinner parties. We lecture a bit and we, uh, we you know, think well of ourselves sometimes, but we try. And if there's something tough, you're gonna see America trying. Um, until another country in the world has that reputation or that core uh, focus, um, I think we're gonna be needed to be around. You want to quickly talk about China's uh, global? China's political distance yeah. from, from us? Um, yeah, a actually, the you know the one of the points in Ms. Park's question also had to do with the Middle East, and I think more, now more than ever, the the Middle East sees a great ambivalence in the way the United States approaches it, and that is, will be a sea change that we need to monitor. But on your question about the di great distance between what happens in the rest of the world, what happens in Southeast Asia and the Ch Chinese political system. I wonder if sometimes we, uh, we need to look at things from a, an inversion. I mean, when the United States lectures us, sorry, I wasn't... I think Europe does more of it. We just get blamed for it all the time. <laughs> <coughs> when the United sorry. States lectures us about its core values, when it lectures Singapore about its version of authoritarian democracy, when it looks around the world and it says, here we've got crony capitalism, there you've got human rights uh, violation, there is insufficient respect for LGBTQ rights. I think every country in the world needs to make up its own mind, its own national cultural de decision on this. There's a perception by some who've told me that while the great political crisis that we saw emerging in the US presidential elections was emerging, what were corporate leaders worrying about but unisex toilets and how they could be set up better? Now, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to give the impression that I think these are not the values that I subscribe to, but it, I don't think it's quite correct that all the world shares a great affinity with the U.S. political system. Uh, a lot of the world is also confusion in the way that we approach social organization, the way in which we approach hierarchies, the way in which we approach rights to, of the individuals relative to rights of society. I think the world is actually a lot flatter in terms of how we look at China and we look at the United States than might be suggested by your question. I just want to briefly respond to that. I think one of the things that I am 
proudest of my president. Uh, and while I proudly am nonpartisan in this job, <clears throat> I work for this guy. And he's the only guy on the planet that can fire me. And if he's thinking about Singapore, things have gone horribly wrong for me. But what I'm proudest about of him is I think we lecture less, but <clears throat> we do believe that the rights of the individual are important, both just for dignity, but also because we believe a society is better for that. If you have a, a society that, for example, excludes women, 50% of your talents off the table. If you have a society that uh, makes it difficult for someone who's Muslim or Jewish to participate, your society suffers and therefore the world suffers. And we believe if you try, try to educate every child, not just the rich and the privileged, uh, you will be in a better situation. As you see, Cambodia has got 52% of their population is under 16. If we don't look at that problem, that's a problem that will metastasize, that we will all have to be responsible for. So while I don't think we've done as, as much uh, lecturing, about, I, I, can't, I don't think anyone can find me a quote from an Obama official that China should be a democracy. And I think there have been administrations in the past that have. Uh, I do think that when we talk about the dignity of every individual, regardless of who they are, what faith they, they practice, or who they love, we are doing it because it's not just some core value that makes us feel good about ourselves, but we, because we believe that the world works better, societies work better, and people as a whole are more prosperous. I think all of us can agree and subscribe to those values. I mean, China has for decades suggested that, well, you know, women hold up half the sky. China is not a society that's retrograde in, along many of these dimensions. Sure. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, your time is passing. There are four questions. I want to give each one of you a chance, if you don't mind. To be fair to everyone, be very quick in your questions. We'll start with you, please. Yep. Um, many years ago, uh, the first world rich countries were very enthusiastic about free trade, signing free trade agreements. And the th poor third world countries were very suspicious, very re reluctant about it. Today, I believe there is a reversal of role. Uh, the the poor, poorer countries saw Free trade was great for them. Hundreds of millions of people in India, China, Vietnam, and elsewhere uh, uh, were raised from poverty. But at the same time, we have a different phenomenon in the rich countries. Uh, jobs were outsourced. Uh, workers found their, they themselves retrenched, or they, they found that their salaries were stagnant for 10 years. So. I believe there is a weaning uh, support for free trade agreements in the richer countries. And uh, so now, now we have two presidential candidates, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, saying they don't want to sign the TPP. They don't, they don't agree with it. So my question is, in, in the light of the current political situation, what is the chance for the lame duck session of Congress to approve the FTPP? Thank you. Thank you. Good that, that's a quick question that, that, that I, I, want, I want to say that, listen, all I'll say is um, I think it's, it's more important that the deal gets passed than when it gets passed, number one. But number two, I can tell you that my guy is going to work till he, they kick him out of that office on January 20th, and he gets to decide if Congress puts that in front of him before then. Sure. Okay, the lady over here. Good evening, I'm Roshni. I'm an adjunct assistant professor at NUS. My question pertains to the anti-trade sentiment in the United States. A recent Gallup poll found that 58% of Americans saw trade as an opportunity and close to 40% saw it as a threat. Given these numbers, from a recent article in The Economist which I cite, plus the stand of both presidential candidates, what will America's trade place in the Asia Pacific really be? Okay, we'll take down the question. Now the gentleman over there, my colleague, yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Martin, I work for the Institute of Water Policy at the school. Um, if you talk about the benefits of globalization, uh, basically you're preaching to the choir here. I was wondering, and I think my, uh, the other commentators have uh, mentioned something similar. I'm a German-American citizen. In both of those countries, um, there's a strong voice of people who doubt the benefits of globalization, 
And to be fair, one would have to say that globalization has winners and losers. So I'm wondering, uh, A, would you think that the fact that globalization does have winners and losers has to be on the table to have a more um, honest discussion, not to leave anybody out? And B, what would you tell to those people who might not be from uh, the academic class that we are here, uh, who might fear globalization, what would you tell them to support them? Because you asked that we should go to the dinner tables, Facebook, Twitter, and talk to other people. So how would you address people who are afraid that they will not benefit from globalization? How do you talk to the losers? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> okay, last question. Thank you, okay, Rajiv Demello from yeah. Schroders. A question for each one of you. One briefly, um, Professor, could you tell us whether how you think that China could actually finance Obor, considering how poorly generally things are doing and the slowdown that we're seeing? Um, can it afford it? And Ambassador, if you could comment on BIT and tell us whether even if TPP passes or not, what are the chances of BIT <laughs> progressing at the next administration? Thank you. BIT? But, uh, bilateral Investment Treaty with China. Which oh, is okay, it? okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, Martin, Martin, I want to first address, where'd you go? There you go. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you know. And before that, there's also a question about the politics of trade. I've got, I've, yeah, I'm, yeah. I just want to, I think that, uh, you know, I, I was a trial lawyer for 20 years, so I would say object to your premise right off the rip, right? Um, yes, there, there certainly are um, uneven benefits uh, and some negative effects, there's no doubt. But again, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to globalization, where I think we leave a huge chunk of that transition, which is technology, out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it suggested, I mean, Danny's the economist, not me, that could be as much as 80% of the U.S. job loss is from technology, not globalization. So it's not that we've lost car manufacturing jobs from Detroit to Mexico or Canada, but to robots. So um, because there is unevenness uh, in the changing economy, should there be more done? Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we have a strain in America of lifelong learning that many uh, folks have not taken uh, advantage of um, or they haven't properly funded. But let's talk about technology with driverless cars. The highest, the highest earning job of any college grad, I mean high school graduate, is truck drivers. The first place that's going to get driverless cars are yeah. long haul trucks. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's a problem. So um, as we go forward, I think every country uh, who's at different uh, points in the value chain is going to have to address this. And it's uh, what Roshni was asking about, you know, frankly, you said 58 to 40 percent, you know, 58 thought trade was an opportunity. That's better than I mm -hmm. thought you'd get. Uh, yeah. So we got, we got places to work on. <clears throat> but I have done this. Uh, when I was, had these roles on ex Export Import Bank, we were trying to double exports in the first five years of the President's administration. <coughs> Florida, like you probably see from your Facebook friends, is an odd state where I'm from. Um, and <laughs> most states have one or two big companies that export. Probably 75% are from a Nike, from a Microsoft, all that. Florida is backwards, and 65 to 80%, 65 to 70% of our exports are for mom and pops. Most of them will send it to a familial relationship in Colombia or Nicaragua or Panama. And so my job was to go out on the road around Florida and said, if you just added a second country, here's how your bottom line mm -hmm. would, would grow. How, here's how, how your employees would grow. And then if you had a third country, it's exponential. But you literally had to walk through what exporting was and why it affected your bottom line and improved their lives. Yeah. Uh, we're not having that conversation. Uh, I would say there's a lot of dishonest conversation about what trade is. And I was telling the story to Danny and Kishore before we came out here. When I go to the United States for work, I try and stop in a city or two to talk about the opportunities in South and Southeast Asia. Because in most of America, sadly, when they think of Asia, they think China. Even before China started slowing down, it got more complicated, not really fun to do business. So a lot of American companies and regions were just saying, forget about it. Um, so I went to Seattle. And I went and spoke to the people that work for the governor, who I've known. He used to be in Congress. He was a Democratic member of, of the House. And I said, why isn't he more vociferously engaged on TPP? And he said, well, it's a political problem. I said, How is that possible? It's Seattle. He goes, well, the union that represents Boeing 
went to the city council of Seattle and moved for a non-binding resolution hmm. against TPP. Now, I don't know where the hell Boeing thinks you're selling planes, <laughs> <laughs> but it ain't Kentucky, okay? <laughs> so it's, and, I, and, and these are folks who, who are great Americans, hardworking folks, but someone has sold them a bill of goods. Yeah. And I think it's incumbent upon me as I go back there, whether when I leave this role or not, is to talk about 95% you know, of our market is outside of our borders. Mm. Export jobs pay 18% more than domestic focused jobs. Those are facts. Uh, and the folks that are not enjoying the benefits of globalization or technology, uh, we need to find ways to help them. And Mark Andreessen just wrote an article about three weeks ago, said there's two economies. And if you're on the low end of the economy and you see Silicon Valley going like gangbusters and you see Wall Street going like gangbusters and you hear people talking about the recovery and you lost your house, and you don't have a new car anymore and your kids are having trouble getting to college, it doesn't feel like it's doing so well for you. And I don't, you know, and I think that's the problem. We're not talking, we're not recognizing there's two economies. Excellent. Can you give a quick response on BIT? Uh, I think the, I, last I talked to Ambassador Bacchus is he was hopeful to get it done by the end of this administration. Um, so if not, it'll be far along down the, it's been, it was, um, there were other more pressing things, I think, in the last economic and strategic dialogue, but it got back on track. I spent uh, 10 days in Beijing in April, and the embassy there was already, and Max, Ambassador Bacchus was all on it. So he's very optimistic. The problem is I think there's like 18,000 different lines that they have to go through. Like this is, this is not a policy disagreement. This is nerd work. Okay. And they are plowing through it. So um, if they can get through it, they'll get through it. But it's not, there's nothing, there's no hold up on that. That's from what I could tell. Okay. Danny? So very quickly, the, <clears throat> there was a question about what the impact we will feel in Asia PAC if the United States goes all, iso goes all close, isolation is on us. There's no question it will be a negative shock. We will feel the pain. But we shouldn't get carried away with how disastrous that might be. Earlier, I cited numbers that said that, you know, while uh, the United States is, a, is a, an important export market for Singapore, uh, but at the same time, Singapore exports double to, the, to what it does to the United States to Malaysia alone. It exports four times what it does to the United States, to Hong Kong and China. All of these numbers will change. There will be shocks that ripple through the system if the U.S. does go all isolationist. But don't panic. We'll be okay. Um, I, I disagree with that, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Not that you'd be okay, but your numbers are wrong because the, 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 the exports that go from here go to Malaysia or China yeah, for yeah, the end market in the United States. No question. So the value that you get comes from the United States. No question. Uh, and I hope that, I hope that you know, the rest of the world figures out the benefits and enjoyment of consuming goods, not just leave it to the United States. To Fair do. enough. Mm. On the you know, foreign direct investment, yes, we will be hit because Singapore's total FDI stock now is about 1,000 billion US dollars, about 15% of that is from the United States. But here's the other thing. Singapore invests in China and Hong Kong in FDI more than it gets from the United States in FDI. That will be a big shock to the system. All this will ripple through. There's the grand circle of value unwinds, but let's not panic. I, you'll agree, we shouldn't I will panic. Not, no, you shouldn't panic. But Don't panic. <laughs> Are you done? Can I go to your FDI numbers now? Because that wasn't right either. I got my numbers from the Singapore government website. I understand that. So I, 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 led a, I, led a, I led a trade delegation to Vietnam, for example, okay. last fall. So and in, in uh, Vietnam's numbers, we were the seventh largest investor. Right. So I went in there, I'm meeting with the deputy prime minister, he's now the prime minister. He says, well, you're the seventh leading, seventh leading investor. And I said, with all due respect, sir, I don't think that's right. These, min these meetings, a minion runs out. I'm going, this could be bad, I might be going to jail. Um, they come back and they said, you're right, because they have, as Singapore companies, Microsoft, McDonald's, and Harley. And that's how we invest in this region. Yes. The United States okay. invests $229 billion into, the United, into Singapore. About 80% of that leaves here and goes elsewhere. Okay. And that's how we you do it too. Your Excellency, I'll leave that for you to sort out with the ministries here. No, they're Singapore companies. They, okay. they can't support Pink Dot, but they're Singapore companies. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to go with what my government tells me. <laughs> <laughs> On the, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Trade, uh, very quickly, I know we're out of time, but on the, you know, on, uh, the question from, the water, from my water colleague 
about what message I will give to people. It, it is a fact that in the United States, there actually is a program called Trade Job Loss Financial Compensation, where if you can establish that you've lost your job because of unfair competition in trade or some other event in trade, you can get compensation for training. I think we need more such programs like that. And here's what I would label those programs. I would say we're here to protect you, but we're also here to challenge you. We will allow you to transition smoothly so that your family doesn't starve, but we need to think about the lifelong learning and the skills accumulation that we want you to go on to the, the next thing. Now, final thing, and this is on numbers. Uh, you know, Schroeder, the gentleman from Schroeder has asked, uh, can China continue to finance One Belt, One Road? It was never China's intention to finance all of One Belt, One Road by itself. Here are some numbers to sink our teeth into. The entire balance sheet of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is 100 billion US dollars. That is tiny. It is a drop in the ocean. Okay, the Asian Development Bank estimates that we need seven times that a year. Admittedly, not, not all $700 billion of that are shovel-ready projects, so there's a lot of things to work through, but the need out there mm -hmm. is great. It's massive. And it's massive, and so we need all the help we can get. AIB has a total balance sheet of $100 billion. What the Chinese government has promised on the Silk, uh, on the silk Belt economic road is only about $40 billion. These are tiny. But what we need is to work in tandem with pools of capital everywhere else, including American, Southeast Asian, everywhere else. It's a collaborative process. It's not going to be China goes out there and builds you something. To give you one quick example of that, in Indonesia, um, you know, they have a huge need for energy. And our companies are rarely competitive on building an actual power plant. But where our companies do well and European companies do well is on project management. So there's many of these projects that are an amalgamation of our best skills and talents. And you know, we can argue about you know, little things here and there, but that's the story that doesn't get told. We're not competitive at building massive ports really anymore, but we are good at having AECOM and a like yep. to do product, project management. Absolutely. So I think that's what you're going to see out here. And the estimated infrastructure needs out here are $8.3 trillion. So that's a lot of stuff that needs to get done. You know, when you have a discussion on trade, it's supposed to be dull, boring, and it puts the audience to sleep. But I could tell none of you went to sleep. <laughs> and I think, you know, there's, there's a limit to how much you can cover in 75 minutes. But I would say that Kirk and Danny have done a brilliant job in this very brief window that we have opened on this subject to actually bring out the complexity of the issues and also brings out some of the political challenges that we face uh, in these areas and will also in some ways inform you when you open the newspaper tomorrow and you look at, you know, you see TPP, you see OBOR, you, you, you find it much easier to follow after having, having heard the perspectives uh, that you heard today. So I think you all want to join me in thanking them for the brilliant job.